Uh, welcome to Tencent Dialogue, a place to learn from the great minds of our time. Today's program is jointly sponsored by Tencent Research Institute, Tencent Carbon Neutrality Lab, and Tencent News. I'm your host, Li Gang Steven, Chief Analyst from Tencent Research Institute, or TRI in short. For those who may not know much about us, TRI is a young enterprise think tank dedicated to studying how the advances in technology would affect the society in general and economic growth in particular. Uh, interested audiences could go to our website, tri.cn, for more information. We're thrilled to have two distinguished speakers with us in today's dialogue. Our first speaker, Professor Jean Tehol, is honorary chair of the Foundation Jean-Jacques Lafont, Toulouse School of Economics and Scientific Director of TSC Partnership. Professor de Hall's research covers industrial organization, regulation, finance, macroeconomics, and banking. In 2014, he was laureated Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics for his analysis of market power and regulation. It's very nice to have you here, Professor de Hall. Our sure, second. Sorry. Okay. Our second guest, Mr. Lin Chihua Davis, is Senior Vice President of Tencent. He joined the company in 2013 and has been responsible for the exploration and development of the company's advertising and smart retail businesses. He also oversees strategic development of the company and derives the group's strategic upgrade and business collaboration. Welcome to the dialogue, Davis. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the topic of today's dialogue, uh, climate change, could easily be the most important and serious threat facing humanity. Rio Earth Summit urged all states to cooperate in the spirit of global partnership to conserve, protect, and restore the health and integrity of the Earth's ecosystem. Yet after 30 years of global coordination, we're still in short of a workable plan that everybody could agree upon. What are the reasons behind this standstill and what is the way out? What could sound economic mechanisms help us to tackle this critical challenge? Professor De Hall's research and observations will shed light on these important topics in the following discussion. About climate change, not all bad news. Some of the recent developments are worth noticing. On December, September the 22nd, 2020, President Xi Jinping, in his address to the general debate of the UN General Assembly's 76th session, announced that China will strike to peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. After this somewhat unexpected announcement, we've witnessed a sea change in the public awareness and perception about climate change in China. Government agencies, as well as private companies, try to adjust and align themselves with this national long-term goal. Tencent was one of the first Chinese companies to publicly commit to a whole supply chain zero emission strategy and plan to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030. What is the current situation of this effort and how the roadmap to reach this goal look like? Mr. Lin, may provide us more details and give us his insights about the role of technological innovation could play in combating global warming in the following discussion. Today's dialogue will be arranged uh, roughly as follows. First, uh, I will invite Professor Yuhol share with us his thoughts on how to build a low carbon global economy. I will then invite Ms. Lin to present us Tencent's efforts to achieve carbon neutrality not too far into the future. A discussion follows. Uh, so without further ado, I will give the podium to Professor Hall, or should I say, give the screen to Professor <laughs> to share his research on uh, how to reach this carbon, low carbon economy. So Professor, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be part of this uh, dialogue, Tencent Dialogue on Climate Change, because it's a very, very important topic, and it's an honor for me to be sharing some thoughts about uh, where we should be going 
it's uh, it's very crucial and it's a pleasure of course to uh, exchange with with Davis so let me uh, let me share some some slides with you and uh, we'll move on from there okay so okay so the the issue is really how can we structure our policies and the international dialogue in order to escape avoid the catastrophe that is uh, coming uh, pretty soon i must say unfortunately so let me start with the obvious the obvious is that climate is a time bomb um, what do i mean by a time bomb simply the fact that if you don't do anything for a year it doesn't really matter but and therefore you can wait but of course one year plus one year plus one year is decades of inaction and that's very bad and you know we have been warning the world at least since uh, rio summit in 1992 that, that has been 30 years and we have done very little and now there is an absolute urgency to to act and everybody has to act in order to be able to solve this issue so we we have too little decarbonization and and too little green r d we have some but you know not enough there are some good news however for example there's progress in some technologies, even so there's not enough. So we have seen a nice learning curve for solar and wind energy. Lead, uh, electric vehicles have made some progress and other things like alternative proteins are making progress. Um, not enough, but it's, it's good news. And the other good news is that uh, the urgency is now widely perceived by citizens and companies. Not everybody, of course, but a fair amount of people. So that, sorry, but there is a problem with uh, citizens' perception all over the world. I mean, what is correct is that they perceive that if you want to turn green, there are losers and there are winners. And they are often pretty clear. Uh, across generations, of course, the winners are the future generations. But of course, there's a cost to be borne by the current generations, but it has to be borne. And also within the generation, we see that carbon tax, for example, we'll talk about carbon price later on, tends to be regressive, which means that uh, poor households are going to bear in fraction of their income a higher share of the burden. But by the way, it's the same thing for most green policies, because who is buying, for example, an electric car? Usually those are well-to-do households. Now, there are correct perceptions, there are also incorrect perceptions. So, for example, as we know very well in France with the Green Jackets uh, story, uh, the demonstrations in the street for, for the year, um, what is visible is very unpopular. You know, carbon tax, for example, is very visible and it has been very unpopular in France and in other countries. Whereas invisible policies are more popular or at least are kind of neutral. So. Cap and trade, uh, so an, an emission trading system, um, is less criticized by the population than a carbon tax, even so it's very similar to carbon tax. Feeding tariffs also are disguised because they go into the electricity prices and they subsidize re renewables. Standard and bans, same thing. Often people don't see the cost, the direct cost, even so this cost is there. And that's, that's really an issue in terms of policy. Uh, people forget that the subsidy is a tax, for example, because, of course, to afford the subsidy, you have to tax other people, uh, sometimes the same people, actually. Um, and some of those interventions using invisible policies sometimes cost much more per ton of, of carbon, of CO2, avoided than the carbon tax. So the carbon tax today is about 60 euros, $70 uh, in Europe, for example, for electricity. Um, it is, you know, sometimes it used to be less than 10, 10 euros. Uh, but there have been uh, actions which have cost uh, like 1,000 or 1,500 euros per ton of carbon, carbon avoided, which means that we could have saved many more tons with the same amount of money. There is also the myth of green growth, green jobs, or happy energy transition. So 
politicians often try to sell green policies, which they, they should do, of course, by saying it's going to increase growth and increase the number of jobs. But of course, with that money, you could have created jobs in education or, or healthcare. It's not clear at all that actually it creates jobs. And you know, if if you could get a nice environment and a faster growth, that would be known. We would have done that 30 years ago. So we have to accept the fact that actually we have to put some costs. Uh, it's not huge, but it's increasing over time as we wait in order to save our planet. The second thing is that we have to accept a number of uh, perceptions and try to also take a holistic approach to reconcile impact and acceptability. So as economists, we care about the impact, trying to uh, save the planet at the lowest possible cost. But at the same time, we also have to take into, into account acceptability. So let me a bit more or precise. It is absolutely necessary to have a carbon price. And for three reasons. The first is that you want to create the right incentive and not spend more than necessary. So if you have a carbon price at $50 a ton, for example, those who can abate pollution at $10 a ton will do so. And those who, for whom it will cost $200 per ton won't do so, they will buy a permit, for example or they will pay the tax. Uh, so it's basically an efficiency perspective. Um, that also encourages R&D, because innovators in green innovations uh, need to be paid for the innovation. And if the carbon price is very low, then there is very little payment they will get. And that will encourage R&D. And finally, something which is less well known is that a carbon price is very simple. It simplifies a the life of the state. We'll come back to that. And it also simplifies the life of economic actors. So if we ask also consumers or companies, or communities, whatnot, want to act and do something nice for the climate, we need actually to um, compute how much our actions do and the carbon price really does that very easy. So let me uh, give you some examples. I want to be green as a consumer, and I'm buying some tomatoes. Should I buy tomatoes which are grown locally, so there, there is no transportation, but they have been grown in a greenhouse, which requires energy? Or should I buy tomatoes which are imported by truck and therefore consuming energy from a country with a warmer climate? So the answer is not obvious because it, it you must know exactly where, for example, the electricity comes from. Is that does it come from nuclear or does it come from gas or from coal? How much my how many miles have been have been driven by this truck? What kind of truck is this? You know, it's very complicated, uh, very very complicated uh, decision prime. And actually, I once talked about this on radio or TV and uh, and a newspaper cartoonist actually caricature me. Uh, hesitating between tomatoes from France or tomatoes from Spain, the tomatoes from Spain uh, growing under a warmer climate, but at the same time coming by truck. Um, but the this is more general. So, for example, if you are a green investor and you want to buy to put your money where you are going to promote green actions. To buy shares in hydroelectric plants, which doesn't emit any CO2, or a fossil fuel company, like an oil company, for example. And you know, the answer seems straightforward. Of course, you know, I want to buy uh, hydroelectricity because it's green. But it's not so obvious if you think about it, because the hydroelectric plant maybe already exists. So buying shares is not going to change the amount of electricity which is produced from hydro. Conversely, if we are going to keep using oil, for example, then you want fossil fuel companies, oil companies actually to emit less and reduce their emissions. And you might want to use a best in class approach. So it's actually a very complicated problem. And as long as you don't have a carbon price, it's very hard to know what's going on. Ideally, you like price coherency, because one ton of carbon is one ton of carbon, 
whatever sector it's emitted, whether it's emitted in China or in France, um, whether it's emitted by household, a firm or the public sector, it's still one ton of carbon. So you should have exactly one price and that's what is going to give you efficiency. Of course, this is really an extreme position, but you know, it's, it's good to know that you want to have one price. And you want an overarching vision along the supply chain. So for example, is an electric vehicle green? The answer is yes, but that depends. Um, if the electricity comes from hydroelectricity, that's very green. If the electricity comes from coal, then that's much less green. And same thing geographically, there is one world. So we can come back to that, but the clean development mechanism of Kyoto was not that efficient at reducing pollution, even so it was well-meaning. A little bit more in detail for the carbon price. Well, the first thing we know from my own country, for example, is that you should have no exemption. So in France, for example, we have a carbon price, which is not, not low. I mean, like 50, 60, 70 euros, um, but we have exemptions. Uh, truckers and fishermen and, and farmers and so on. And that's very inefficient because you get multiple carbon prices in the economy. It's unfair because some pay the carbon price and some others don't. It creates lobbying. Along the same line, we should stop fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, most countries in the world actually subsidize fossil fuels like oil and coal very much, unfortunately. It's not a very beautiful instrument for the reasons I gave. So, third item, allowances or permits. Um, we should have an extension of the ETS system. I mean, you have an ETS system in China for electricity, for example. Um, but we have to stabilize prices a bit because we want to give some guidance to those who engage in long-term investment like uh, electricity plant or buildings. Um, and you need some kind of, not certainty because we know that there is uncertainty, but we need some guidance on what the price will be. So price floor and price ceiling can be it can be useful, but there are other ways to do it that I, we could talk about if we, if you'd like to. And we want to do that, say, for example, for European countries, do that at the European level. Of course, China is a required scale for doing that. And last point, which is very important from the French experience, is that the money you get from either the carbon tax or the sale of permits in an ETS system is to be reduced, distributed in part to the losers, because otherwise they will complain a lot. And that applies both within countries, but also across countries. So, for example, in Europe, we have this issue that uh, Germany and Poland and Portugal are still using coal, and we know we have to get rid of coal. But at the same time, they say, oh, our miners are going to be in trouble, they're going to lose their job. And of course, you have to, to spend some money, try to make the transition as nice as possible. Second big item to do is research and development subsidies. Um, there is a need for significant technological progress to meet the promises. Okay, so we need, we need breakthrough technologies that we, we don't have. We need, for example, storage technology. So we invest a lot in coal and in, I'm sorry, in, in wind and solar energy. I mean, not that much, but we do invest in wind and solar. But of course, there are intermittent uh, energies, so we need to store the electricity. Uh, and we don't know to do, how to do that efficiently at this stage, so we need to try the various storage technologies. Now, the reason why there is not enough R&D, green R&D, is that first, the price of carbon is too low. And there is an anticipation that it will remain too low compared to what it should be. But of course, there are standard externalities like R&D externalities that you find in other fields. So um, in a report that I've written with Olivier Blanchard, it was an international commission of 20, 26 economists, eight of them being French and the rest uh, from abroad. Uh, we actually recommended an RPAI um, uh, so some kind of industrial policy for disruptive innovation for Europe, France being too small, Europe is a bigger size uh, to do that. 
But the important thing when you do industrial policy is to have the right governance. And I think we'll come back to that. There are a number of criteria to be uh, respected in order to do the right uh, industrial policy. And we don't always do that in France or in Europe, for example, we don't always have good industrial policy. And I, I, I can give you some example of better industrial policy. The second thing is that we should not put all our eggs in the same basket. We just don't know what is going to work. Something is going to work, but we don't know what. I mean, just see, if you think about uh, um, vaccines, for example, um, very few people in 2020 were actually thinking that uh, uh, RNA messenger uh, vaccines would work. And it turned out that the two main vaccines were Moderna and Pfizer biotech. Um, so that really means that before doing the R&D, we don't, just don't know what's going to work. And it's the same thing for uh, green technology. So standard and mandates. Um, so there are other ways uh, than using a price, either a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. There are other ways of doing things. So for example, command and control. Uh, we can impose a standard. So for example, this car cannot consume more than X gallon per mile. Um, we can include mandates for housing. We can uh, have a sector or geographic geography based targets. You have some of that in China as well. Now you have market based uh, solutions for electricity in China. And in general, you know, economists prefer a market based solution. They are simpler and they give rise to a single price. And that's very important. But in practice, you have a fair amount of common and control instruments, um, and they can actually complement the price mechanism if the carbon price is too low for political reasons, or if it's uh, difficult to measure emissions, or if uh, households are imperfectly informed. So for example, if they buy a house or a car, and they don't know how much they will save in terms of the carbon tax in the future, that's difficult for them to make the right choice. Um, but so we can have some uh, common and control, even so we prefer market-based solutions, but in that case, we need to estimate the implicit cost. So how much does it cost in terms of euros or dollars or RMD, RMB uh, a per ton of CO2 avoided? Um, so that, you know, sometimes you don't spend five dollars and sometimes five thousand dollars to save a ton of carbon it makes no sense maybe you can create an independent agency to actually guide in terms of implicit cost what shall we do with electricity well the consumption will increase significantly with decarbonization we are going to have electric cars for example and you, you have some already in china uh, we will have more and more electric cars we'll have electric eating uh, heat pumps and the like. So um, maybe there will be twice as much electricity used as now. It will depend very much on the country. And that means two things. The first is that you have to increase the generation. So it's not only the mix, it's also the amount that you have to increase. And you also have to invest in the grid because sometimes you produce in one part of the country and then you consume in another part of the country. So yeah, you have to re reinforce the high voltage grid. Um, discussion about nuclear power, which is taking place in France and Europe. Uh, my own view is that we need to keep nuclear power. Even people who don't like nuclear power, uh, they should think that nuclear power doesn't emit uh, CO2. And you know, given the state we are in, uh, we don't have much choice now. Choosing among new generations is a more complicated thing, and I'm, I'm not an expert for that. So we need, uh, we need. Um, I'm just looking at how much time I have. We need to actually cooperate, and that's very, very important to understand. Because if we don't cooperate, and all the countries in the world have to cooperate, um, because otherwise they will do what I will call zero ambition things. So. Sure, it's not because you don't cooperate across country, you are going to do nothing about green uh, green policy. So if only because you know you have collateral damages like uh, 
uh, sulfur dioxide and particles when um, which is a local uh, public good as opposed or public bad as opposed to CO2 which is a worldwide global public good or public bad. Um, large countries like China or, or the US will internalize some of the consequences and of course in you might want to placate uh, public opinion at home and avoiding international pressure but still there can be a lot of free riding every country tries to shift the burden onto the other countries and that means excessive emissions that's even worse if you have leakages which means that if you impose a carbon tax in your country then the production moves to another country which doesn't have a carbon price and of course there is also a, a waiting game uh, in, in view of future negotiation okay um, I will come back to all those things in a discussion, of course, but uh, um, in terms of Europe, um, you may want, uh, wh what can Europe do? I mean, actually, uh, it's a small fraction of global greenhouse emissions. It's uh, actually now it's even less than 8%. Um, it's between 6 and 7% and it's declining. Um, still, Europe can do some stuff like being a role model show the way and Scandinavia has been very good for that actually in Europe the role model is really Scandinavia the Scandinavian countries have have had a carbon price and a decent carbon price for a long time Sweden has have has had over $100 per ton for a long time for example so Scandinavia is a role model but Europe might also play this role uh, doing green R&D and getting intellectual property which can be transferred to poorer countries and helping design international agreement. Um, but the question is, which process should we, should we be using for those international agreements? There is, of course, a COP, uh, COP process. We had a COP26 in Glasgow recently. Uh, but it could also be a climate club. It could also be an existing uh, international working group. Um, and we could discuss all of that. And let me, let me conclude with uh, two things, two policies which are very well-meaning, so in a sense they look nice, but in the end they may not be so good. Uh, they, that's what I will call false good ideas. Um, in France, for example, we have a new law which says that environmental criteria should be embodied into public procurement. So on the face of it, it looks very nice because you say, oh, sure, there's a big uh, global warming issue and therefore we are going to care about the environment by basically giving a, a plus, giving extra points to those who are greener. So on paper it looks very good. The problem is that it raises two issues. The first is, is the local authority of the village or the city or the region, is it able to measure emissions? And in the current state, no. The answer is no. It's, it's not able, it doesn't have the instrument to measure emissions, and on top of that, it cannot measure emissions along the supply chain. So it's just impossible to do. The other danger is, of course, that the local authority either free rights and basically puts a low implicit carbon price in, in giving extra points in the, in the public procurement context, contest, or it favors some friend, cronism, it panders and so on. So it doesn't look too good. The second issue, which applies pretty much everywhere around the world, is that there's a lot of talk about green central banks. Um, so basically, uh, having the central bank also in charge of global warming, um, some of it is already in its mandate. So for example, if you think about stress testing, um, you know, Global warming is going to give rise to a macroeconomic shock because the day we react to that possibility, we haven't done so yet, but the day we react and we take things seriously, then there will be a big macro shock. And this shock is actually growing the more we wait. And this shock also translates into the solvency issues for banks and insurance companies. So that means that in terms of regulating those financial institutions, you also have to look at the exposure to 
fossil fuels, for example, uh, by the banks and by uh, insurance companies. But again, there are the issue about the ability to measure emission for the moment. For example, the ECB or the Fed are not equipped to measure emissions, especially along the supply chain. I probably have spoken for too long. Steve, you have been very kind to me. I just want to mention that uh, if you want to read more about uh, what I just said, there is economics from the common good. And thanks for the advertising, Steve. But also uh, a report that I have uh, chaired with a commission, I've chaired with Olivier Blanchard, which was a report written for President Macron, but also more generally for Europe. It's an independent independent commission that, and you can find the report. It's not only a climate change was only one third of the report, but you can find the report um, on the web. You just type this. Okay. Well, thank you so much again for the invitation and uh, and for the attention. And I look for, forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, yeah. This uh, it's, it's it seems like uh, Professor have. Uh, talked a lot of things in this short time frame. It's 30 minutes. It's impossible to cover all these uh, very deep topics in just a short a period of time. And I highly recommended everyone to uh, buy the book or read the book. They have been translated into different languages. And uh, you can learn a lot from these uh, much more uh, 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 contents and just good de deeper discussions in these books. So next time, uh, Davis. Right. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, and thank you, Professor, for your uh, candid sharing. Uh, I, I do uh, really conquer a lot of the thoughts that you, you talk about uh, in the brief uh, introduction of your thoughts. Um, and I think particularly uh, I think carbon tax, um, it's or carbon price, um, it's something that me personally been thinking a lot when I was uh, going through some of the um, discussions and analysis on uh, how to drive carbon neutrality uh, in any geographies. Um, you know, because there is clearly a, a reward and um, you know, investment divide today um, for new technology to take in place, for behavior to change. Uh, and uh, as a sort of a, as a practitioner of uh, business, I, I do believe economic levers, uh, it's probably, um, you know, most effective uh, at the end. Um, but, you know, with, with, you know, Saying, you know, having saying that, I recognize that there are so many challenges and there are so many uh, issues as you lay out uh, that we need to consider. Um, so um, I, I'm going to share from a, a, a private institution, a, you know, a corporation perspective on how we uh, see the uh, the challenge on uh, on the uh, global warming and carbon neutrality. Um, and then hopefully some of that sort of anchor back to what you share uh, in your speech. Um, so let's move on to the um, next page. Um, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you know, climate change uh, is truly global, is, uh, is, very, is, is of high urgency. Um, you know, there is, we are uh, on, on a very close path to uh, 1.5 degree raise. Uh, I think we're now standing at about you know, 0.9 to point, you know, 0.8 to 0.9. You know, uh, different scientists argue different numbers, but we, we clearly see a raising trend for average temperature. Um, and then we're also experiencing some of the major um, you know, climate disasters already uh, in different corner of our globe. Um, and uh, as we see, um, you know, we, we the, the, the time is kicking, um, as Professor, you point out, um, you know, it's, it's of high urgency for us to act. And then it's not just one person, it's not just one country, it's not just one company. I think every uh, everyone, we as a global citizen need to uh, take actions um, to save our planet. Um, so 
you know, you know, our perspective, and then this is probably more from a sort of a technology, uh, what that work, how how make things work, and then also from a business perspective, you know, we we see plenty there are four major areas to uh, to tackle. Um, you know, four major emitters. Uh, one is obviously uh, power, electricity generation. Um, you know, I think China in particular is um, is very serious issue because most of our uh, electricity come from fossil based and then particularly uh, coal based um, uh, power plant. Um, and then um, the the other area is heating. Uh, so many people. Uh, particularly in the uh, high altitude um, countries, uh, there are billions of people need um, heating on winter, and then today most of the heating solution comes still coming from fossil based, uh, and then that also costs quite a bit of the um, you know greenhouse emission, uh, and then there's transportation. Um, even though the electricity e- electric vehicle is uh, is being Quite popular and been introduced for almost a decade, um, but still the uh, the penetration is relatively low compared to um, all the uh, install base of uh, all the automobiles uh, around the globe. Um, and not to say uh, there are uh, long haul trucking or uh, airplanes that we haven't found a real solution to replace uh, current old fossil based technology. Uh, and the material, um, you know, all the buildings that we built requires cement and steel. Uh, and cement and steel is a big emitter uh, in their production process, um, a big emitter of greenhouse. And this is a real issue, and not to say also other um, petrochemical you know, industries. So this uh, area, even though we sum up into four areas, but there's so many different verticals and involved in different uh, chain of uh, our our life and then our our industrial uh, civilization that uh, we need to make dramatic change and then that's why you know I sort of concur with you, uh, professor, that there need to be a powerful um, drive to to pull the uh, to get the lever mo- moving. Um, then the you know from a technical perspective, I think um, the the pathway toward a, a low carbon or even a, you know zero carbon emission uh, future uh, is actually um, straightforward summarized into three things. One is e- electrification. Um, instead of using distributed fossil and burning, uh, you know, burning you know natural gas, burn, burning natural gas or burning you know coal burning uh, gas links. Um, you know, make um, make the energy coming from uh, electricity, and then change the uh, electricity energy structure from heavily rely on fossil into uh, greener or uh, pure green um, and resources. So that's clearly uh, a pathway. Uh, second is uh, hydrogen economy. I mean, when we say hydrogen, it's uh, it's a point to Professor, you mentioned earlier storage, uh, because there are so many um, uh, green, greener uh, power, uh, power source that has uh, the issue of uh, uh, interpolness. So it, it essentially, uh, what what you need is you have you need to have distributed uh, storage, and you need to have um, you know storage to to solve the uh, the you know the the peak and the off peak loading balancing on the on the you know electricity grid. Uh, so hydrogen is as uh, you know sort of stay as a powerful promise uh, to uh, to the uh, storage solution uh, because itself um, if the technology actually work out. Um, you know the the sort of energy transfer from uh, from water and back to uh, energy itself doesn't really uh, generate too much additional emission unlike other um, you know battery um, productions. 
Uh, and the third is uh, obviously carbon capture and um, storage, um, because at the end, you know, there will be uh, carbon emissions that we cannot really uh, eliminate. Um, so how do we capture them, uh, and how do we, you know, sort of put it back into our mother Earth? So that's that's sort of the. Uh, you know, the, in, in a big summary, there are three pathways that we, we need to go. Um, so, uh, you know, I think uh, you also require um, different parties to work together, right? So uh, obviously there is policy, uh, which is probably the most important thing because uh, it's the rule setting. Uh, and there's capital, capital means investors, uh, you know, or, or, you know, existing corporations. Um, and there are uh, technology innovators, uh, researchers, developers um, who need to be properly rewarded um, to uh, continue uh, to solve big issues uh, along the pathway that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then there's consumers. Consumers need to have stronger and uh, higher awareness. Therefore, they'll be asking, uh, you know, solutions from, uh, you know, companies providing services. They really need to, um, you know, you know, really need to go to into a solution level. So, you know, this, you know, this four different uh, pillars, you know, there are so many different things that uh, actually link to consumer capital, technology and policy, but you know, it has to work together or link together so that we have a possibility to achieve carbon neutrality. So these are the big pictures uh, from, uh, from Tencent when we're thinking about um, how do we form our um, strategy toward uh, carbon you know, neutrality. Um, so what we uh, plan to do uh, are four programs. So first is um, make sure that we are uh, achieving our, our own carbon neutrality. So we as a meter, uh, we need to uh, look into uh, the source of emission. Um, most of them are um, data center and then the electricity that use uh, to support our data centers. How do we make sure that we go back to work with uh, the state grid, the uh, power generation companies to get greener uh, source of energies. Uh, and the second program is uh, whole around technology. And this technology has two, you know, two broader meanings. One is uh, we want to, um, you know, push and then uh, just sort of support uh, already close to mature or mature uh, greener technology to implement more. Uh, and the other is we want to uh, support the development of uh, high potential, but you know, relatively immature technology like uh, hydrogen that I mentioned earlier or uh, carbon capture or storage. Um, so that's the technology area we wanted to support um, the implementation and support the continuous development of um, of, of technology that address the, uh, the the carbon neutrality issue. Uh, and the the third thing we think that we can bring, which is a bit unique um, that we can bring onto the table, is digital solutions. Um, you know, I got to elaborate later, but, you know, think about how if you can make a, a core-based uh, power plant running more efficient, uh, therefore they use uh, less, they, they can emit less carbon while they still generate the same, uh, same amount of electricity. That's already an improvement. That is also part of the lever to, to abate um, their current emission problems. Uh, and think about uh, the agriculture. Uh, there are so many different independent farmers. If you can find ways to help them uh, make better use of their land, uh, whether it is reduced uh, emission uh, in their uh, in their in their crop uh, growing process, or uh, you know, install some uh, green energy facilities so they can make extra money uh, from their lands. Um, so those are the uh, the the, the digital 
uh, the realization that we're thinking about um, using um, you know, technology and particularly the, uh, the computation power to make uh, the current operation more efficient. Um, then uh, the fourth program is uh, consumer. Um, so we're thinking about, you know, working with, you know, encouraging, um, you know, a lot of internet users, uh, and we, we, we serve a lot of internet users in China. So want to uh, raise their awareness and promote a low carbon lifestyle. So those are the uh, four programs. Uh, I gotta go a bit uh, details. Um, so um, we did our, uh, our own uh, carbon audit. Uh, and then um, our greenhouse gas emission in 2021 is um, 514 million tons um, of uh, you know carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, and then we are, um, and then obviously there's a scope one, scope scope three. I'm not going to detail in uh, in this uh, wi widely known um, characterization. Uh, and, you know, as I plan, explained earlier, the ma majority of that coming from the power and then particularly coming from uh, the electricity that we consume in our data center. Um, so that that's the, uh, the snapshot of uh, what we needed uh, last year. Um, and then we we are going into uh, a pathway to commit to be a carbon neutral by 2030. Um, on our own operation and our supply chain, which is you know scope one, scope two, uh, and then uh, we also committed to uh, use 100% renewable energy uh, by 2030, and that you know definitely require uh, a lot of effort um, because we 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 our operation spread across China uh, with electricity coming from you know many different uh, grid uh, and then also uh, power generators, so we have to work with them uh, to find uh, green electricity uh, and hopefully, you know, getting more and more new ones to install into the uh, the uh, grid. So not just using the, the existing hydro, uh, but, you know, looking for more and more solar and wind uh, new build projects uh, to help us uh, where the, the electricity demand grow uh, as a nation, uh, we can uh, help them to grow more and more into green uh, energy structure, um, and uh, we will, you know, we'll take many different in initiatives to make sure that we achieve uh, efficiency in our office building and also in our data center. So that's the uh, uh, ourselves as a meter. Um, then uh, next page um, on the technology. Uh, we will support development and scale up of low carbon technologies. Um, so I, you know, I mentioned an example of uh, village solar panel. Um, so we're trying out on several villages in in China to uh, bring the uh, panel uh, builders and then uh, bring in the financial institutions. Uh, we being the sort of a project organizer and then. Uh, orchestrating uh, villagers who doesn't necessarily have fun, doesn't necessarily have knowledge to uh, to run the uh, the to 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 start the uh, solar power panel building for their village, uh, and then uh, eventually then we, we we turn that into a win 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 a win for the villagers who get additional revenue, uh, and win for the uh, the the greed who get you know additional uh, green power and then you know also win for the uh, financial institution uh, to, to have a financing project. Um, another example is uh, we're working with uh, Iceland based company uh, called Carfix. Uh, you know there's they're they're specialized in um, uh, carbon mineralization. Um, so that's the uh, carbon storage. So we try to um, find a proper site in China to uh, make adoption of uh, storage, mineralization of storage. Um, so um, hopefully that number one can reduce the cost. Number two doesn't have to find uh, you know the other solution, which is you know more expensive uh, on the on the cover storage. Um, next one. 
Um, the third, third things that I mentioned earlier is the uh, digitalization. So uh, we're looking to uh, try more and more different projects uh, to use the uh, computing power. And then you can also call it AI uh, the, um, to help uh, different verticals to improve their efficiency. Therefore, naturally, they can achieve higher productivity with lower uh, carbon emissions, uh, like including uh, AI for uh, power plant, AI for uh, water uh, processing, uh, and then also AI for farms. Um, so th those are the areas we believe, uh, you know, would, would, you know, from Tencent can be uh, another a uh, very interesting angle to contribute back to um, society to uh, to convey this big, uh, you know, carbon, you know, big carbon uh, issues that face by all human beings. Um, and uh, last one is the um, consumer. Um, so uh, we we start trying out uh, on uh, working with different parties. Uh, on the left hand side, example of low carbon planet, uh, we work with Central Government uh, to uh, have uh, a mini app that uh, promote uh, citizens in city to record their um, green mobility activities, and then they get a little reward, and then they, you know, also they raise their awareness of how different transportation modes. Uh, would impact the earth. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you know, we, we have the, the carbon island, which is a game. Uh, we, you know, we use that game and then uh, a sort of town construction, um, you know, sort of a role play game for people to build their own low carbon uh, island. And then along the way, we raise their uh, knowledge and then raise their awareness of what behavior would uh, lead to a low carbon lifestyle. Um, so those are the things that we've been trying and obviously we're looking for uh, exploring more and more um, actions that we can do to raise uh, awareness on the consumer side. Um, so this in sum sort of bring together um, uh, why Tencent is doing this. Uh, we, we have the mission of tech for good. You know, we are a technology company uh, we are fortunate to uh, build uh, a, a very good foundation for our business, uh, but we always have in our heart that uh, we should be doing uh, good things. We should, you know, support it, you know the user. We should support uh, the community, support uh, the, the nation, support the uh, earth going to a better directions, um, and we try to bring this good heart and value um, through implementable programs. So the full program I introduced uh, along our um, carbon neutrality initiative are, uh, you know, are based on the goodwill, which is tech for goods uh, that company believe in uh, and then try to make that, bring that into the action. Uh, so from, the, from, from that perspective, that I conclude our uh, so sort of my, my, my talk on the Tencent side and looking forward to a more exchange with Professor and Steve uh, on a bigger issue. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. Uh, very nice uh, and uh, quite uh, uh, provides a very detailed uh, roadmap or uh, the general pictures of what Tencent is about in this carbon neutrality initiative. Uh, Professor, do you have any comments on this? Well, no, I, uh, I very much enjoy the presentation. It's uh, obviously very important. Uh, um, in terms of the four pillars, uh, policy, tech, uh, capital, and consumers, um, I think that this is very well taken. And the weakest part somehow has been policy, not because we don't have a framework. I think we do have a a good economic framework for solving the issues, but more in terms of the countries and governments' willingness to address the issue. The tech part, I'm confident because if we have a carbon price and enough subsidies for R&D, 
My guess is that you know, in the US, in Europe, in China, everywhere there will be lots of innovation, which is going to help solve the issue. So that's that's a good news. But then, as long as uh, government doesn't, governments do not act enough, we are left with a civil society. Are, are left actually to do something about it, and that's why the kind of action that Davis talk about is very important. Um, because a substitute for uh, for for the missing policies, um, so yes, I mean so basically reminding consumers of their social duty is important. Uh, they have to consume less and they emit less, especially um, helping farmers uh, through AI or other categories through AI. I mean, I'm thinking of about vertical farming, for example. One of the actions that you encourage. Uh, is important giving advice to local community, especially the, the small ones. I'm sure Shenzhen and Shanghai may not have such a need for that, but the smaller communities don't have the personnel, uh, the expertise to do that, and go through basically the uh, the regulatory apparatus and all the constraints, and it's fairly complicated. So having advice is very important. Um, you know, basically using digitalization. Uh, you know, green energy uh, for for Tencent is important, but if you give rise to new investment, that's a different ball game. So that's very good. Um, the one thing uh, I'm wondering about, um, but it's a question. It's not a criticism. It's just a question. Is <laughs> in terms of um, of uh, subsidizing uh, tech companies, uh, for example, for hydrogen. Um, or carbon storage, capture and storage. The question is, uh, in terms of the expertise, actually uh, encourage innovation. Encouraging innovation is actually quite hard. Uh, I will come back to that from the point of view of the government. But you know, if you think about how ca venture capital is organized, actually venture capital is actually a set of governance mechanism and, and expertise, which is very important. So the the question is what kind of expertise you mobilize and what, of, what kind of governance you have when you try to subsidize. But you know, on, on the face of it, it's, it's a wonderful action to undertake. This, this question is for Davis, right? Yeah, um, I, I can pick that up. Um, so, so uh, Professor, we uh, in Tencent, we have uh, actually uh, it's been, uh, been decades that we run um, the corporate venture. Uh, and investment arms uh, with intents and uh, and doing uh, having uh, you know in, by all means uh, quite successful track records in uh, selecting uh, new startup to support them uh, with capital um, to to grow. So we we are taking a very rigorous approach in terms of looking for uh, potential candidates who has. Um, you know, a more promising uh, perspective for their uh, particular technologies. Uh, that's why we bump into, you know, we're looking for startups not only in China, but uh, outside of China. Uh, and then we're looking at a very specific period. Sometimes we join together with other venture capitals um, to uh, to uh, invest in um, in in the uh, new technologies. So that that's that's one. Second is um you use the word subsidy um it's uh i i i, I agree and, and disagree uh, i think we try not to think this as a subsidy we try to say you know this is uh, a higher alpha um investment that means we we don't know that much whether um, such project will eventually pay out or the company will eventually be successful so we bring the the heads of um, uh, tech for good on the uh, uh, on this in, in this in investment, and not only just look at the financial return uh, based on what we know. We also factor in more risky factors. Um, so we pick uh, companies, we pick a partner to work with, um, you know, but not necessarily uh, subsidy, but more of a taking higher risk. Um, uh, and then you know probably had a higher 
uh, percentage of a failure, uh, I, I guess. But uh, we're willing to do that as uh, as also part of the um, the unique Tencent um, commitment, and then using our capabilities to to help drive the um, the development of neutral, uh, carbon neutrality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, did, did, did Davis answer uh, that uh, you were satisfied yes, with he did. Davis? He did. Okay. Um, what, well, well uh, this is not according to the schedule anyway. And uh, supposedly, I should ask the uh, private sector's role and this uh, commitment to the carbon neutrality, but uh, it seems like the professor has already answered that question. And there's a um, uh, discussion, and uh, actually there's a slide in your presentation that, uh, talking about the uh, uh, carbon price, but uh, there are several ways to achieve this uh, uh, carbon price. There, will be, there, there could be a tax, there could be a cap and trade system, uh, and for the tax, it seems like uh, quite easier and ob obvious and visible. I use the word that you used in your presentation. Uh, it will be estimated like a 60 euro per, uh, per ton of uh, CO2. Well, when we say price, what do we mean? Okay, that, that, that's a good question. There are, there are multiple prices. So. Um, there's a price which uh, you would like to apply worldwide. So how do you compute that? But basically by starting from the carbon budget, so we know we can still emit a certain number of uh, tons of carbon to reach 1.5 or 2 degrees. Um, and then we have this carbon budget, so it's a quantity. And from this quantity, we can try to infer what price and price progression I mean, the price of carbon should be growing over time at the rate of interest basically but uh, it should be growing over time and um, you adjust a carbon price in order to reach that target assuming that everybody is applying it and that's of course a big if um, and that's why people came up with numbers like, say, $50, $60 per ton today, growing to $200, $300 per ton tomorrow uh, by 2030, 2040. I mean, there is, of course, uncertainty. And, and we have to understand there is uncertainty because uh, there is uncertainty about the technologies, you know, the, what uh, what Davis was talking about, We, you know, how fast we'll be able to develop storage technology, hydrogen, uh, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, uh, caps, captures, uh, carbon capture and storage, and nuclear, new stuff, new new, new models of nuclear power, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about technologies, there's uncertainty about politics, uh, because you know the more we wait, uh, the more expensive it will be to actually achieve the goal. Uh, there is uncertainty about acceptability by citizens, you know, about their willingness to save carbon themselves. So, you know, you know, Davis talk, talk about a norms-based intervention, trying to change a norm among citizens, which is very important. But there's a lot of uncertainty about whether it's doable or not. Um, so, overall, we know that we're going to make mistake in that price. That's why we need to have some kind of visibility, some kind of guidance uh, as to what the price will be tomorrow. That's why we need some mechanism like a carbon uh, carbon price floor and, and ceiling maybe, so that actually inventors or investors know that they will get some minimum return on their investment if they choose a green investment. So that's, that's actually very important. So that's one price. Now, you could have different prices too. So if you think about, uh, for example, the um, the prime you face, so Tencent wants to become carbon neutral um, and by 2030, say. So it has to reduce its emission uh, until it's zero in net, of course, not in, in gross, but in net uh, by 2030. 
Um, and you look at how much it will cost you. What is the optimal way to do it? You know, maybe you want to reduce faster one item, but slower another item. And you, you know, you, you, it's a technical issue. What is the best way to do it? But in the end, you have a, cons a carbon emission today and you will have a carbon emission tomorrow, which will be zero. And how much does it cost you to come to get to zero? And that will give you a carbon price. Now, is this carbon price going to be around $50 per ton or is it going to be $2 or is it going to be $2,000? I don't know. But you see, every, every sector, every company, every household, every has a different number. And sometimes, you know, that, that raises issues in terms of targets which are given, for example, to an industry. Because it, you know, if you, if you think, for example, um, take the French electricity company, companies, um, they have almost a carbon free uh, production. It's just by history, because we have invested a lot in nuclear. And therefore, most of the electricity in France is actually carbon free. Now, if you ask, if you ask uh, France to reduce substantially its carbon emission for electricity, it will be incredibly expensive because it has redone the most it could do almost. Whereas in some other industries in France, it will be very cheap to do that. And if you give a target by sector or by company, you may end up with very different costs or very different implicit price of reducing the carbon emission. Now, for in your case, I think, you know, the as you mentioned, you know, pretty much the data centers are the big issue for you. But it's a smaller issue than for many other industries. Uh, um, probably it's not going to make a huge difference for ten cents bottom line, but it's still important to try to figure out how much you spend in order to get uh, to uh, to zero net emissions. Um, and that's that's an exercise we have to do, but it's a pretty complicated one, and I, I can see that. Are you sure? Uh... Uh, Davis, do you have any questions uh, to Professor? If you don't have, I will ask you one question. I do. Um, okay. uh, I was listening to uh, Professor's explanation on the price. Uh, and then that just bring me back to um, a project I did about a decade ago, uh, actually more than a decade ago, probably 12 years ago. Uh, I was I was uh, still in a McKinsey and Company. I was working for um, the Chinese government uh, on the um, on the uh, what we call carbon abatement cost curve project, and that project was essentially, uh, you know, it's creating a, a cost curve that says um, on different abatement levers. You know, whether it's a carbon capture, whether it's a hydrogen storage, whether it's, um, you know, we, we try to take it as a national level, national level. So it's, a, it's a entire China. And obviously, if I look at, you know, if I, I were to go back to the, the report I write, um, um, I wrote uh, 11 years ago, a number must be all very off. Um, but that, that's sort of a framing that says uh, if we were as a country, uh, to to reduce um, so many uh, so much so uh, greenhouse emission. Uh, these are the possible levers, and this is and different levers we assign the best guesstimation of uh, cost, and then you end up with a total cost of um, of that country to achieve. Uh, carbon neutrality, assuming you can pull all these levers successfully. Uh, and I'm pretty sure the um, you know, fans would have a very different cost curve given uh, the, the current electricity, so mainly based on nuclear power, uh, power plant. Um, and then uh, India would have different one, China would have different one. Therefore, you roughly would be, you, you know, following that framing, you should have um, uh, carbon price uh, based on countries sort of a, you know, 
admission and then a payment, uh, different payment lever add together. Uh, and then the you know the best estimation of the cost, and then you can find it, you know, the mechanism to to sort of uh, do a you know cross country translation of how this is gonna work, um, you know so on and so forth. So you know I, I was just thinking along the line. So this is really not the question to Professor, but this is more of an add on on my previous experience on uh, how I think about carbon price or uh, carbon the payment cost. If I cannot um, follow up on your what you said, uh, and I agree, of course, the beauty of a carbon price is really that you can decentralize the decision. So, for example, if you say the carbon price is 50 or 60 dollars per ton, then automatically uh, those who can pay it at a lower cost are going to do so. And we have this experience with coal, as you know, coal is is a highly polluting uh, uh, material and um, and it pollutes twice as much as gas, for example. And gas is not clean, but still twice as much. And if you have a price around 40 or $50 per ton for carbon, then there will be substitution from coal to gas. Now, that's exactly what happened in the UK. So in the UK, the UK reduced its uh, it's a carbon emission substantially almost overnight because it put a price on carbon and immediately the share of coal switched from 40 percent to five and then to two percent of the electricity production and given some of that was actually substituted by gas but gas is not clean but still pollutes twice twice as less so in the end there was a huge decrease with a fairly low price, you know, 40, 40 dollars or 40 euros per ton. With a fairly low price for carbon, there was a huge impact on what happened in the UK. Uh, because of that, that's a beauty and you decentralize. Uh, and each each actor in the in, in the economy and go, there are lots in China, of course, you know, actually finds a way to actually reduce pollution if he or she can uh, and not if he you know, buying and paying the carbon tax or buying a pollution permit if, if she cannot. So there is, a, there is a simplicity in the price which you can allow decentralization to the actors. That's actually very important. Otherwise, you have a big planning issue where you try to compute things, but you don't quite know what the abatement cost curve is. And that's obviously more difficult to do. Sure. Uh uh, what uh, uh, Professor Hall just uh, talked about, the UK uh, put a price on the coal uh, uh, burning. This, what my in general impression is that when you talk about specifics like the coal as uh, the power supply, uh, the main resources of power supply, uh, then it, it's easier for you to measure the carbon emissions. And when the measurements are clear, it's kind of easier for you to put a price on it uh, and everybody can see it. Uh, but uh, from what Dave is just to share with that, the story, there's different levers and uh, it's hard for you to, you know, measure, come up with a uh, generalized measure for everyone, for every firms, for every different industry sectors. And the measurement itself, it becomes a very uh, difficult issue and it's not very clear. Uh, and, and then there could be come up with all different kinds of problems. Like what you said, that uh, uh, sounds great, but false, good ideas. It seems like uh, if you don't have a clear measurement of the emission, then everybody would gamble with the system. And, uh, you know, so the good ideas may turn out uh, will not bring anything clear or, or good. So that's uh, that's my general uh, kind of uh, thinking. So, um, and my questions to Davis, this is also from uh, not included in the question list. Uh, you have uh, just uh, showed us the statistics uh, so that uh, if Tencent, you know, 
uh, are often considered much greener when compared with those uh, uh, energy intensive industries like power plants, like steel mills. Uh, so of course there's uh, the, the direct emission from uh, Tencent is a small fraction. So you have to be able to, like uh, you, you said uh, by 2030, like 100% will from the renewable energy. And uh, have you considered all these possibilities when you announced the, uh, when Tencent announced its um, carbon neutrality uh, strategy and the roadmap? Uh, what would be, what would be uh, some, if, if there's some backup plans? So let me break down sure. for you, okay? So scope one, scope two, scope three, uh, uh, by definition, uh, you know, what we, uh, what we categorize our emissions, and then scope three is mainly linked to um, the uh, upstream and downstream, uh, and scope one and scope two uh, are mainly linked to our uh, our own operations. Um, so uh, we're confident that we are addressing uh, scope one, scope two, and the majority of source uh, of that emissions coming from data center, uh, as I mentioned a couple of times. Um, so that's a clarification. Second is um, on the um, data center emission, how, uh, how confident are we um, achieving um, you know, 20, 20, 30 pledge on you know, 100% green energy, uh, given the energy structure of our state grid, um, it's, uh, it's far from 100% green. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's uh, the the kick where we we're gonna establish um, you know numbers of uh, long term purchasing uh, agreement with uh, state grid and the, you know sometimes directly with um, you know power generators uh, who offer green uh, green source uh, green energies um, so we'll be establishing those agreement with state grid and then a designated um, green uh, Green power providers, um, many of them are wind farms or solar farms, uh, and then we were also looking into um, promoting and participating as a minor shareholder into some of the new uh, green energy projects that would, uh, you know, that would come up with new. Uh, a uh, new source of green energy, and then the, that the, the green energy that would then in, you know, inject into the state grid, and then would then uh, you know, pass down to uh, you know, electricity users. Um, so in reality, um, you can argue Tencent still every bit of the uh, electricity is coming from the grid, and then the um, the commercial agreement that we had. Uh, and they are going to establish with the street with the with, with the the state grid. We we would um, add new capacity or designated capacity that's coming from pure green, uh, and then make sure that's going to the grid. And then we'll be um, will be uh, defined as the consumer uh, of those uh, green electricities. Uh, so even though the entire uh, energy structure is, you know, far from 100% green, uh, we contributed to uh, a shifting of the uh, energy structure toward green, and then our consumption is uh, using that designated green power. Thank you. That's very nice. Well, it seems like uh, you really thought through. Well, uh, another question for a professor. Uh, you ha we have covered, we have uh, spent really some time talking about the uh, R&D, the future technology. Uh, what, what's your view about this allocation of the property right, uh, the intellectual property right? Uh, if he, there's a lot of uh, government subsidies involved in this, involved in this, uh, in, in this uh, R&D process of green tech. Well, uh, this is a very good question, and uh, the private sector can actually innovate quite a lot. Uh, but you need the incentives for that, and the incentives, of course, for a corporation is, you know, has to do with profit, or at least not to lose money at the very least. So, you know, you can lose money on some side activity, but you, are, you cannot lose money overall. So, 
you know, in, in, in terms of developing new vaccines, for example, or new antibiotics, which are missing at this stage, what you need is to have at least some prospects for recovering your R&D cost. I mean, vaccines or in, in medicine, it's often up to $1 billion per, per, per medicine. It can be huge. Uh, so you need some prospects. So intellectual property is what helps you actually uh, monetize your the outcome of your uh, innovation. Uh, but this intellectual property, of course, should be uh, applied mainly to uh, to the rich country um, and emerging countries, but the poor countries should not be uh, paying for it. So, um, th and that's that's really the issue, uh, you know, and that's doable. And I think for green technologies, a little bit the same. And something we have to realize is that if the developing countries don't get on board and don't put a lot of effort into reducing their pollution, we'll never reach 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius. It's going to be a disaster. So even the poor countries have to do their share and basically have a high carbon price. The problem with that is that they are poor. So they will want to have first transfers, cash transfers, and that the idea of a green fund. Also, I'm very critical of the way it's organized, but still, that the idea is that to help the poor countries actually to meet the energy transmission transition, they have to be ambitious and we have to pay them for that. And the second thing you can do is to develop innovation that will, uh, that you'll be charging in the West or in rich country, OECD countries and so on. But at the same time in poor countries, they will be free of, uh, of royalties. So that actually they can be installed in, uh, in Africa, for example, for, for close to zero. And that, of course, will will help Africa and, and the other poor countries actually to uh, uh, to also fight climate change. So we need to help them. Um, and then there's a question. There, there are many questions in your questions. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and one of uh, one of, uh, of your questions is how to organize R&D. And, you know, clearly the private sector knows how to do that. What you need is to give them the right incentives, right? The private sector is more efficient than the public sector into discovering new technologies. And, but they, they must confront the right incentive. Um, so what most countries did, like the US or Europe or, or Japan and many countries, subsidized and had a different rule, intellectual property rules for orphan diseases, so that the pharmaceutical companies and the biotech would have incentive to develop medicines for those very small markets. Um, and here, you know, we have a mar market and government failure in, in the sense that the price of carbon almost everywhere except in Scandinavia is too small. Um, you know, as I say, it should be 60 euros for all industries <laughs> and all households. And we are far from there. Uh, including in China, of course, and we need to raise the price. But in the meantime, uh, we need to do also more R&D. And, and the more so that we don't price carbon efficiently, um, and we need a process to do that. So the process, if I have a few minutes to explain, is twofold. You know, you have the general R&D subsidies, and the general R&D subsidies, like a r and tax credit, is some kind of subsidies that apply to any firm to do uh, R&D subsidies, to, to do R&D. But then the, that's, that's non-targeted policies. And then you have industrial policy, which is targeted uh, to a particular firm, a particular technology like hydrogen or a particular industry. And they are more fine-grained, somehow fine-tuned. Um, and the idea there is that uh, the government decides to actually promote hydrogen, for example. Now, if you do that badly, that's totally wasted money. Uh, what you want to do is to basically make sure that the money goes to the companies which are able to deliver. So where you want to sow where the soil is fertile, if you want. So there's no point of pouring money 
and giving that money to someone or some company with, which is completely unable to do it. You need to retarget to the right people. Um, you need to have the right governance. So uh, Davis was talking about uh, his experience with venture capital. And you know, the venture capitalist screens for the right people and the right project but also knows how to stop them. So basically, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You have to redistribute the money and give it to somebody else who is going to work to make it work. So that's very, very important to know that you need a real manager. This manager, if possible, must be a scientist because a scientist will understand the issue, um, must be independent, independent from the industry and independent from the government because the government might have its own objectives too. So, you know, it's actually quite complicated to, if you want to avoid white, elef white elephants, that may be useful. So it's actually, it's not a science, but it's an art. And you really have to, uh, to think about how you want to organize um, basically science-based uh, R&D industrial policy, but you need the right processes in order for that to work. And it's- Anyway, gentlemen, we are, uh, running out of time, it's, uh, can you just, uh, Professor, can I, uh, and uh, Davies, can I ask uh, you, like, uh, spend about uh, two minutes to conclude this, uh, your, your discussion and your points? This time, maybe Davies, come, you comes first. Sure. Um, well, I think uh, carbon uh, emission is, uh, clearly, um, probably the the highest um, of the highest urgency for entire human beings. Uh, if you look, uh, you know, toward next five, ten, fifteen years, um, and um, I think we we should all put our, our minds together with um, the best intention uh, to. Uh, to to try to solve the, the issue together. Um, so today we actually talk quite a bit about uh, policies, the technologies, consumers, companies, um, you know, different industries, electricity sectors. Um, so I believe a lot of this thing had to all happen and um, and then work at um, you know quite a fine level. Uh, for us to avoid eventual disasters. Um, so, you know, we look forward to as tense and we look forward to uh, contribute uh, the best we can. Uh, and also looking forward to, um, you know, to see more and more smart policy development uh, and looking forward to see the, um, the happening of, you know, carbon price, uh, carbon credit, uh, so that uh, the ultimate you know, incentive can work uh, to drive a much broader, uh, you know, set of uh, participants to to join together to to drive to, to solve this very difficult and challenging task. Sure, Professor. Well, I I agree with everything David said, and it's very important that we get our act together. It's very urgent precisely because it's a time bomb. So we can wait one more year, but after 30 years, we are still waiting and we might still be waiting 10 more years. And then that will be a terrible disaster. How to destroy a planet for a couple of points of GDP. I mean, it sounds totally crazy, but that's where we are. And I argued basically that the governments have a huge responsibility in that. And you know, they keep fighting with each other instead, instead of co cooperating. And that, that the optimistic and positive view is that actually we do have solutions uh, to this issue, but we need to get our act together. So in the meantime, we have to be socially responsible workers, socially responsible firms, socially responsible investors and consumers, and try to do our bit, but we should not forget that in the end, uh, we need the governments to help us achieve the common good. And I really strongly hope that uh, we are going to find a way. Uh, as I said, there are solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is today's uh, Tencent Dialogue. Thank you, Professor John Hurl, 
Thank you, Davis Lin. That's very uh, valuable and worth uh, one and a half hours discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye.